Welcome. Thank you for joining us tonight. I'm Carolyn Waters, the head librarian. We are thrilled to be hosting Janice P. Namora on her new book, The Doctor's Blackwell, How Two Pioneering Sisters Brought Medicine to Women and Women to Medicine. First, because this is an excellent book. And second, because we always love hearing Janice talk about the New York Society Library as her second home. We feel like she's family too. We have been along for the ride as she's been researching and writing the book and we're celebrating the publication along with her. Many of you may have already read The Doctor's Blackwell, but for those of you who have not yet, you're in for a treat. This is a fantastic read, a powerful and highly entertaining narrative about the two sisters, Elizabeth and Emily Blackwell, who are complicated, fascinating women. But you don't have to listen to me. I am just a librarian who is always happy, happy to recommend the books that I like. And I love this book. I devoured it in two days. The critics, and there are many dozens of reviews of The Doctor's Blackwell, are in agreement with me. Joanna Scutts in the New York Times book review calls the book a richly detailed and propulsive biography. The Wall Street Journal says, Ms. Nomura's portrait of the Blackwell's America blazes with hallucinatory energy. And one of our other favorite historians, Stacey Schiff says, Deftly, with a keen eye, Janice P. Nomura has resurrected Elizabeth and Emily Blackwell in all their feisty, thrilling, trailblazing splendor. Janice received a Public Scholar Award from the National Endowment for the Humanities for support of uh, her work on this book. Her previous book, Daughters of the Samurai, From East to West and Back, was a, was a New York Times notable book in 2015. Her essays and book reviews have appeared in the New York Times, the Washington Post, the Los Angeles Times, Smithsonian, the Rumpus, and Lit Hub, among other publications. And now I am going to hand it over to Janice behind this virtual podium. It, um, it's great to uh, be here with you all tonight. Um, I sort of wish we were in the members room and there were nibbles and lovely glasses of wine on hand, but um, I uh, will be there and we're there in spirit and we'll be there for real before too long. Um, I'm gonna share my screen and do some pictures because that's much more fun. Um, okay, excellent. Okay, so um, some of you may remember that for my first book, Daughters of the Samurai, I had a wonderful origin story that was centered on stack one of the New York Society Library. Um, that's where it all began for me. Um, and that is still where I where I chart the beginning of my life as an author. Um, but I, I, I regret to say that um, there isn't a, a nifty origin story um, on a different stack level for this one. Um, so the Blackwells, if you're familiar with their name at all, um, you're probably familiar with the name Elizabeth Blackwell, um, and it usually is followed in your mind by the phrase first woman doctor. She was the first woman in America to receive a medical degree in 1849. Her sister Emily, there on the right, uh, followed her into medicine to become the third woman uh, in 1854. And together they founded the New York Infirmary for Indigent Women and Children, and then the Women's Medical College of the New York Infirmary. So how did I come to this story? I stumbled across the Blackwell story for the first time five years ago. And this astonished me. Um, this was despite the fact that I had been born, raised, and still lived in the city where they practiced. Um, I grew up at a proudly feminist all-girls school from the age of five on 83rd Street, if you're familiar with that one, um, and was the math science kid there and graduated with the intention of pursuing medicine. And I had never heard of them. How was that possible? I, it, it, it made me very curious. So I went looking for them. Um, and I discovered that they are not hard to find on the children's biography shelf. If, when I asked around, have you ever heard of the Blackwells? The people who said, yeah, I know who Elizabeth Blackwell is, generally said, yeah, I had a book about her when I was little. Um, all the books had some similarities. This is a chapter book version from the 40s. Um, they all featured a slim, attractive, well-dressed young woman with a stethoscope, bending solicitously over a grateful patient, um, 
this is the, as I say, the chapter version. This is a middle grade version, a modern one from um, my daughter's school library, Once Upon a Time. Um, again, nice clothes, stethoscope, grateful patient. Um, here's a, a picture book version, slightly younger, perkier Elizabeth with bows in her hair and the stethoscope, which is in the bag waiting for her to grow up. Um, the black walls looked like this um, and they were never photographed holding stethoscopes. And if in the 1840s and 50s, when they were as young as the women in the picture books, if they had been photographed holding stethoscopes, the stethoscopes would have looked more like this. So the picture books were incomplete. And I began to look further and follow Elizabeth and Emily into the archives and to listen to their voices on the page in their own letters and in their journals. And what I discovered was that these were two very complicated women, not picture book princesses. Um, and I began to want to know them with all of their ragged edges, um, not just what fit in a picture book, not, not um, adorable or saintly heroines, but, but the real women. Um, and it became important to me to reintroduce them in all their complexity to the present. So what is their story, briefly? Um, eight out of the nine Blackwell siblings, they were a tribe, were born in Bristol, England, and came to America as children in 1832. They were the children of a paradox, a man who was a sugar refiner who had made his fortune in the sugar industry, and in his spare time was an ardent abolitionist. Think about that for a sec. Um, he gave his children all of them, daughters as well as sons, the gift of an education at the same level. Um, and then on the strength of a dream, he moved them all the way from Bristol via New York to the edge of the known universe in Cincinnati in 1838. And that dream was the dream of making sugar out of sugar beets in the North without enslaved labor, rather than um, being dependent on Caribbean sugar cane um, and exploiting the lives that that, that farmed it there. Um, he got his family all the way out, now nine children, all the way out to Cincinnati in 1838. And before they had even finished unpacking, he died, broke, leaving his widow and nine children with about $20. His final lesson was that a husband is no guarantee of security. None of his five daughters ever married. So, so we have nine Blackwell siblings who have sort of become a tribe and turned in toward each other, um, depending on each other in a rather precarious moment in their lives. Um, and they, they become this sort of clan that prefers each other to everyone else in the world. And it became a great gift to a biographer because there were nine of them. They stretched an age at this moment from six to 22. Um, and for the rest of their lives, they were rarely in the same place and they rarely stopped writing to each other. So they say in biography, if you don't Feel like you're drowning in material you probably don't have enough well i was drowning in material um, and a lot of it looked like this this is just sort of a fun glimpse into the challenge of doing 19th century archival research um, in the 1840s um, the blackwells did not have a lot of cash and postage and paper were expensive and so they did something called cross writing um, here's a close-up look um, what you did is you filled the paper from top to bottom and then you turned it 90 degrees and you filled it again. Sometimes you flipped it over and did the same thing on the back. This is a letter from Elizabeth's brother Henry to Elizabeth in 1844. Henry had exquisite handwriting, so this is actually not that hard to read. Um, but they were constantly writing about each other and to each other, and it gave me a great gift in terms of multiple perspectives to use in telling this story. So Elizabeth, Elizabeth was born in 1821. She had her 200th birthday last month on February 3rd. Um, she was voraciously brilliant, socially quite awkward and blessed with a healthy sense of self-worth. She admired the transcendentalist writer and editor, Margaret Fuller, who in this moment in the mid 19, sorry, mid 1840s had just published a bestseller called Woman in the 19th Century. And in this book, she argued that humanity was not going to achieve a new level of enlightenment until women proved their own powers, um, until they claimed their own independence. She believed that women could be anything they wanted to be. It was a matter of effort and talent, not sex. Women could be sea captains, she, she argued. Um, and until 
women proved this, humanity was not going to rise. Elizabeth, as I mentioned, with a healthy ego, saw herself in this call to arms. She saw herself as someone whose life could prove Margaret Fuller's point, um, whose achievements could help lead women and therefore humanity toward the light. So she chose medicine. And it was an interesting strategic choice. She chose it not because she loved science or because she liked taking care of people. She really didn't like people very much. Um, she thought sickness was a sign of weakness. She thought bodily functions were disgusting. But medicine in this mid 19th century moment was an unusually clear way to prove her point. Medicine was redefining itself, both scientifically and institutionally. To this point, it had been considered more of a trade, the trade of midwives or barber surgeons. Now, increasingly, it was a profession of men who were credentialed by virtue of having gone to a medical school and gotten a degree. And increasingly, there were medical schools in America. So Elizabeth thought, if I can find my way to a medical school and attend all the lectures and pass all the examinations, who can argue that I am not as qualified as any man to be a doctor? And as this cartoon from the 1820s suggests, um, medical school at this moment was not the incredible academic challenge that it is today. Um, medical school in the 1840s consisted of two identical consecutive 16 week terms of lectures only. Uh, if you were lucky, you got to do a little bit of dissection, but mostly you were sitting and listening and taking notes. Um, the, the students that pursued medicine tended to be the ones that weren't smart enough to pursue the law. Medicine was not quite as prestigious yet. Um, so well, it was pretty clear to Elizabeth that if she could find her way into a medical school, given her own intellectual capabilities, which were extremely advanced, she would have little trouble finding her way out again. Um, so she decided to pursue this course. At the age of 26, she managed to secure admission to a tiny rural medical school called Geneva Medical College at the tip, the northern tip of Seneca Lake in the Finger Lakes region of New York State. This was after a sheaf of rejections from all of the more mainstream and urban and prestigious medical schools. Um, and the story of Elizabeth's admission is one of those moments um, where you have to kind of tease out the story from multiple accounts. If you read Elizabeth's memoir, which she wrote 50 years later, it seems fairly straightforward. After many, many rejections, finally she received an acceptance and with joy in her heart, she got on the train to Geneva and off she went. Um, the real story was somewhat more, more farcical. Um, what happened was Elizabeth was studying independently in Philadelphia with a sympathetic um, and progressive-minded physician of some social prominence. And he had written her a letter of support with her application to Geneva. Um, the faculty of Geneva College, being not the most prominent physicians, given that they were all the way out in the, in the sticks, um, weren't quite bold enough to reject this recommendation out of hand, but they really didn't want a woman coming to their school. A woman, the idea of a woman studying medicine was outrageous. The idea of a woman wanting to learn about bodily processes in the company of men was appalling, just appalling, a non-starter. But they weren't quite brave enough to say no out of hand. So they punted. They sent the question to their students and they said to this group of rather boisterous provincial young men, okay, men, um, here's the question. If any one of you objects to this woman studying among us, then she won't come. And they figured this'll 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 secure it. No, no, no one's gonna want her to come. So then we can say the students didn't want her. The students, recognizing that their faculty was quite cowardly in this moment, and recognizing also that this could be an opportunity for serious mischief, um, called a meeting and after basically bludgeoning all the dissenters into submission, returned a unanimous yes to the professors, and then forgot all about it. They figured it must have been a prank cooked up by a rival medical school until three weeks later when Elizabeth Blackwell walked into the lecture hall. Um, once admitted and once able to actually apply her interests, she discovered that um, medicine was the intellectual challenge she'd been looking for. She warmed to her subject and she quickly rose to the top of the class um, and earned the respect of professors and students alike. Uh, they began to realize that if they sat next to her, they would do better. <laughs> um, in between terms, in between those two consecutive terms, um, the students went to get some practical experience elsewhere and Elizabeth returned to Philadelphia where she became a resident assistant uh, and the first woman anywhere near 
uh, Blockley Almshouse, which was at that point the largest municipal hospital in the country. Um, it was, as, um, as others have called it, a, a warehouse for the destitute. Um, if you ended up at Blockley, you were at the end of the line. Uh, you were either suffering from mental illness or you had no options left. Um, she ended up um, in a room off the female syphilis ward and anybody who ended up in the hospital with syphilis, tertiary syphilis was in, was in very poor shape. Um, this was a great place to watch uh, illness. It wasn't a great place to learn much about healing, but um, Elizabeth suddenly had a lot of practical exposure. Um, exposure to the connections between poverty and public health, between uh, the plight of women and venereal disease, um, and also to ep epidemic illness. Um, this was 1848 this summer, and waves of refugees were arriving from Ireland and continental Europe um, carrying with them what was then called ship fever, typhus. Elizabeth ended up writing her thesis for Geneva Medical College on typhus, I think an interesting um, non-gendered choice of topic. Um, and she became more and more interested in the question of public health from this original exposure. She graduated at the top of her class from Geneva College in 1849, and that thesis on typhus was published as the lead article in the Buffalo Medical Journal. Elizabeth was quite a formidable talent. Um, this was unprecedented in every direction. Then she did what many medical graduates did in America, um, which was to go to Europe for practical training. Um, this was something that many American graduates did to sort of acquire some polish, to burnish their medical reputations. Um, she went to Paris. And Paris at this moment was a wonderful progressive center of medical education. The state um, was, was supporting medical education in an extraordinary way, which was entirely closed to women. So frustrated, Elizabeth ended up here at La Maternité, a, a municipal maternity hospital um, housed in this old convent, which still stands. Um, this was a place for young women from all over France to come to learn how to be midwives. They came as students. And even though Elizabeth had a medical degree at this point, um, she wasn't really able to get in anywhere where a man might be. So she committed herself to being a student again um, and moved in to La Maternité for several months to, um, for the benefit of the volume of obstetric cases she would see. And in this setting, she underwent a crisis that changed the shape of her career, if not its direction. She never lost her determination. Um, I mentioned that, uh, well, I didn't mention, um, uh, women with any means at all would have delivered at home in 1849. Um, if you were delivering in a public hospital, it meant that you had no other choice. And a lot of the women who were delivering there were prostitutes, many of them infected with venereal disease. Um, a baby that passes through the birth canal of a woman with gonorrhea can end up with an eye infection called gonococcal conjunctivitis. Elizabeth was tending to one of these infants early one morning when some of the washing liquid she was using to clean its infected eyes splashed into her own face. And she ended up contracting gonococcal conjunctivitis, which today would be not a joke, but not terribly dangerous um, in the age of antibiotics. Then, before antibiotics, it was catastrophic, and she was immediately confined to a bed in the very hospital in which she had been working, um, and lay there for weeks, hovering without the knowledge of whether she was going to retain her sight at all. Um, this is another good moment for the um, sort of the, the a glimpse behind the scenes at what my job is when I'm trying to find the the, the, the truest path through multiple um, accounts of the same incident. Um, she was under the care of her colleague, the wonderfully named Hippolyte Blot, um, an attending physician at La Maternité that, who had become friendly with her. Um, 50 years later in her memoir, she wrote about her confinement and her illness like this. Ah, uh, how dreadful it was to find the daylight gradually fading as my kind doctor bent over me and removed with an exquisite delicacy of touch the films that had formed over the pupil. I could see him for a moment clearly, but the sight soon vanished and the eye was left in darkness. It's almost like a romance novel. And, and this man definitely fits the bill of romantic hero. Um, at the same time uh, in Paris, at this moment where, where Elizabeth is languishing, um, her eldest sister, Anna Blackwell, happened to also be in town. 
Um, Anna Blackwell, as this <laughs> portrait wonderfully suggests, um, was indeed a drama queen, um, a hypochondriac and a journalist by profession. And she spent her days tending to her sister at her bedside and her evenings writing long letters home to the Blackwells about what was going on with Elizabeth. Um, this is how she wrote about Elizabeth's medical crisis. The pupil presents just now the appearance of one of those little misshapen blackberries of three granulations and half dried up that one sees so often on some scrubby little bush. If you can fancy one such in dull looking lead, you have just the appearance of this poor eye. Mm. Um, uh, Anna wrote about this with almost unseemly gusto, but it does give you a very graphic sense of what Elizabeth was up against. Eventually she lost one eye uh, and was fitted for a glass prosthetic that she wore for the rest of her life. Uh, in this portrait, you, if you look very closely, you can see that there's an asymmetry in her gaze, but um, very few people were aware of her disability. She never spoke of it. Um, and you couldn't really tell. On she went, even though um, surgery was closed to her now, um, she was not going to stop and, and give up on her medical quest, although it did reorient her more and more toward the direction she was already inclined to, which was public health over actual practice. Um, okay, so does Elizabeth go home to Cincinnati to convalesce for a moment before she continues on? No, of course not, she's Elizabeth Blackwell. On she goes to London, where she continues her training at St. Bartholomew's Hospital, another um, storied public hospital. And there she meets, introduced by mutual friends, she meets Florence Nightingale. <coughs> and Florence Nightingale in this moment is not yet Florence Nightingale, the hero of the Crimean War, the lady with the lamp. Um, this is 1851, and Florence Nightingale is at this point a young woman about a, a year older than Elizabeth who um, is the daughter of a wealthy family that desperately wants her to settle down and get married. Um, I like to imagine that this encounter of Nightingale with Elizabeth Blackwell was sort of an epiphany for both of them. Um, here's Elizabeth Blackwell, who has left her family and any question of marriage far behind and is um, equipped with a medical degree already, ranging all over Europe, acquiring medical experience. To Florence Nightingale, she is proof that Nightingale's own, own, own dreams of, of making a difference in, in the field of health are possible. Um, Elizabeth, for her part, I think is enthralled by Nightingale's um, sort of social stature and, and stability. Here is a woman um, um, who is in a different place in society than the Blackwells are, um, and who has the same kind of ideas about hygiene and sanitation that Elizabeth is starting to think about. Um, they have this sort of rapturous friendship at first um, and really kind of support each other um, toward the future until they become, it becomes clear to both of them that they have a, a, a basic misalignment in their, in their direction. Florence Nightingale believes that women are to be nurses, that the difference she is going to make is through the field of nursing. And Elizabeth Blackwell is determined to prove that women can be doctors. And they never quite align on that question. Um, still, Elizabeth Blackwell goes on to use many of Florence Nightingale's ideas in her work in the future. So her training in Europe completed now, Elizabeth chooses to return to New York to set up a practice. And she believes that this is going to be a slam dunk, right? We're gonna go back to New York and women are going to flock to a female physician um, to be able to confide their most intimate ailments to a woman instead of to a male doctor. And she gets there and she sets up an office and no one comes. And why not? Well, because in 1851-52, the very phrase female physician connotes someone like Madame Restel, the notorious Fifth Avenue abortionist, um, shown here in a cartoon from the National Police Gazette as a baby-eating demon. Um, female physician connoted somebody who was working in the shadows, on the wrong side of the law. If you were a, a, a you know, a respectable middle-class matron, you were not going to consult a female physician. And if you were, you weren't telling anybody about it. Um, this was a basic problem for, for Elizabeth. No one was showing up. What was she going to do? How was, her, how was, how was she going to move forward in her profession? Um, she was becalmed and dismayed. Meanwhile, she had anointed her sister, Emily, five years younger, to follow her into medicine. 
Um, she recognized that this was going to be a lonely, arduous life that she had chosen, and she wanted company. And she thought more highly of the Blackwells than anybody else. So she surveyed her sisters and chose the most brilliant one, also the one who was next youngest to her, Emily, who frankly was already showing signs of being interested in science, more interested than Elizabeth was. Um, and Emily, I think also being used to having three rather domineering older sisters was used to saying yes to them. And so she said yes to Elizabeth and decided, okay, I, I will try this as well. Um, one would have thought that being the second Blackwell sister to try to get into medical school, it might have been a little easier, but one would be wrong. Um, Geneva College said, no, thank you. We don't want any more women here. Um, and so did every other medical college. Um, the other compounding problem was that in the years since Elizabeth Blackwell had graduated from a men's medical college, women's medical colleges had begun to open. There was one in Boston and there was one in Philadelphia. So as long as those institutions existed, it was very easy for the men's medical colleges to reject women. Why do you need to come here? Go to the women's medical colleges. That's where you belong. But Emily didn't want to have a degree that was any less impressive than her sister's so she persevered. She found her way first to Rush in Chicago, where she spent her first year of medical school very successfully. Um, but when her mentor went on sabbatical, the trustees asked her not to come back. Uh, all of a sudden, she was stranded in the middle of her medical school career um, without an institution. And she pivoted to Cleveland Medical College, um, where she eventually received her degree. Cleveland Medical College has since evolved into Case Western. Um, so there's Emily. What does Emily do now, having finished her degree? She does what Elizabeth do, did. She goes to Europe. Emily goes to Edinburgh, where she attaches herself to the practice of one of the most prominent physicians in Edinburgh, James Young Simpson. Um, he was physician to the Queen. He was a, a professor at the University of Edinburgh. Uh, he was the man who had discovered the anesthetic properties of chloroform. The story goes that he discovered the anesthetic properties of chloroform by passing a decanter of chloroform around at the dining table, whereupon all of his friends burst into hysterical laughter and then passed out under the table. Um, he was a flamboyant man and a bit of a showman. I think he quite liked the shock value of having a female among his assistant physicians. But at the same time, he respected Emily's abilities and taught her a great deal. He was an obstetrician and a gynecologist. Um, so he would be teaching her the use of instruments like these, a, a pessary, which would have been inserted into the cervix in cases of uterine prolapse, all too common in women with too many pregnancies. Um, the instrument below that is one that he invented, a uterine sound, kind of a graduated probe that was used to measure the dimensions of the cervix. Um, Emily would have been learning to use these and learning also something that he had pioneered, the pelvic exam. Um, which was at first startling, and then um, she recognized very useful. Meanwhile, she's writing all of this home in letters to Elizabeth. And if you look closely at the left side of that letter, you'll see she's sketched those two instruments that I just showed you pictures of. Um, Elizabeth is underemployed and a little desperate in New York. Emily, meanwhile, is at the forefront of, um, of medical technique alongside Simpson and teaching her sister everything she was learning. Um, from the beginning, I really felt it was important to tell this story as a story of two sisters, not just Elizabeth Blackwell, first woman doctor, but Elizabeth and Emily, um, sister doctors, because I, I don't think either one of them would have gotten as far as she did without the other. Um, however, there is more material on Elizabeth Blackwell. She wrote more, more was written about her. She was the first, so there's always going to be more material. Um, so what do you do when you're trying to write about two women, but you don't have as much information about one of them. One of the things you can do is follow them around. And this is the fun part for me. Um, for instance, go to Edinburgh and see all the things that Emily saw in the, in the, in the stretch of time that she spent there. Um, so this is 52 Queen Street, uh, Simpson's house, which still stands. This was the place she would come every day uh, to climb to the second floor and um, attend in his consulting rooms. The day I walked by to take this picture, um, the door was open. So in the spirit of following in the footsteps, I walked in. I believe it's a drug counseling center now, so I wasn't exactly trespassing on private property. Um, but I wandered around in there for a little while, feeling what Emily would have felt until someone asked me to wander out again. Um, even though in that brief encounter, though, you, you, you see things that teach you things. Um, for instance, James Young Simpson's initials are worked into the banister of the staircase in that house still. Um, that was the staircase that Emily would have walked up every day. 
um, passed the initials of her boss, um, which also said something about him. What kind of guy puts his initials in his own staircase? Anyway, I also got to go to the Royal College of Surgeons has a wonderful medicine uh, history of medicine museum. Um, and they wouldn't let me take photos, but this was my sketchbook. You can see things like on the left in the middle there, um, Simpson's pocket pill case, which he would have taken on house calls. It says, please return to 52 Queen Street under the lid. Uh, it would have been contained scary things like opium and mercury. Um, medicine was still in a relatively primitive state. Um, down below that, you can see two of his stethos his monaural stethoscopes in, um, in, in rosewood and ivory. I wanted to believe that maybe Emily had used one of them in examining some of his patients. They even had the decanter from the chloroform. Um, so Emily is learning to be a doctor from, from Simpson. Um, and by the time she's done there, she's really quite accomplished. Um, it doesn't protect her, unfortunately, from the kind of snark that Elizabeth had come in for before her. This is a caricature in the London satiric newspaper Punch, um, meant to show Emily in the scandalous bloomer costume of the women's rights activists, of which Emily was not one, let me just say. Um, anyway, she's wearing a ridiculous hat and has a rather mannish profile, and she is squinting diagnostically at the only patient who will consult her, a lapdog, being clutched um, in the arms of a more conventionally feminine maiden. Um, luckily, Elizabeth and Emily were both excellent at ignoring this kind of silliness. So Emily is now finished with her training, and off she goes um, back to New York, finally, at last, to join Elizabeth. And together in 1857, they found the New York Infirmary for Indigent Women and Children um, in a building that still stands on the corner of Bleecker and Crosby in the village, on the left as it was and on the right as it sort of looks. It's, it's, it's undergoing a wonderful re re uh, restoration right now. Uh, and I'm privileged to know the woman who is spearheading that restoration, who let me in. And um, I got a chance to see some of the interiors um, that revealed the original brickwork and rafters and sash windows that Elizabeth and Emily would have seen when this floor was used as a hospital ward. I love moments like this when you can sort of feel the ghosts around you. Um, as you might expect, uh, having just founded an infirmary in, in the lead up to the Civil War, the, the Blackwells played a role in the Civil War. Um, just after the first shots were fired in 1861, uh, they called a meeting of their uh, supporters and donors um, in their own infirmary and drafted this appeal that ran in the New York Times, an appeal to the women of New York and especially to those already engaged in preparing against the time of wounds and sickness in the army. Um, in response to this appeal that was published in the Times, um, thousands of women converged on Cooper Union's Great Hall for a meeting um, dedicated to the idea of channeling all of the chaotic support for the Union cause into something useful. And out of this meeting grew an, an organization called the Women's Central Association of Relief. And out of that organization grew the U.S. Sanitary Commission. So you can sort of draw a straight line, if you like, from the Blackwell's parlor to the most important civilian organization of the Civil War. The Blackwell's ended up uh, in charge of the committee that was um, charged with vetting and training young women to become nurses and be sent to the front. Uh, they threw themselves into this work, um, uh, but and, and, and for a while felt like they had really um, reached a, a Margaret Fuller-esque level of collaboration between women and men in, in the service of a great cause. Um, that soured relatively quickly though, um, because it became clear that New York's male physicians were not largely interested in working alongside female physicians. Um, they, for instance, excluded the Blackwell's infirmary from the list of hospitals that would be training the women that they selected to be nurses. Um, they didn't have any trouble working alongside women per se. It was the physician label that, that, uh, that alarmed them. They, for instance, chose Dorothea Dix to be uh, in the chief leadership role in Washington. Um, Dorothea Dix was not uh, a medical, medically trained person. Um, Elizabeth referred to her not in a nice way as the meddler in chief. Um, and, and Elizabeth and Emily became sort of dismayed and frustrated and eventually withdrew their support from the war effort in order to turn it to their next project. Um, 
Ironically, after um, women's medical colleges had been founded, the Blackwells didn't think very highly of those women's medical colleges. Um, they had founded their own infirmary as a place uh, to train the slowly growing numbers of female medical graduates, but they were noticing that they weren't particularly well trained coming out of those female colleges. Yet, as long as those female colleges existed, the male medical colleges were not going to accept women. What to do? So the Blackwells eventually changed their mind, and in 1869, they founded their own women's medical college, the one with a degree of rigor that was beyond those of the men's colleges. Um, they were having students come for three years instead of two. The courses didn't repeat each other, but built on each other. They were able to provide practical instruction at the bedside in the infirmary. So they, they resolved to found this um, as sort of a placeholder until the men wised up and, and agreed that it was ridiculous to segregate medical education by sex. Um, so that was the arc of Elizabeth and Emily Blackwell's professional lives. Personally, they were just as interesting. Both sisters adopted daughters. Um, Emily lived with her female partner and fellow surgeon, Elizabeth Cushier, for the last several decades of her life. Two of their brothers, Henry and Sam, married two of the most prominent feminists of the day, uh, Lucy Stone, uh, a suffrage activist, and Antoinette Brown, who was the first woman to be ordained as a minister in this country. Um, to complicate matters, matters further, Elizabeth and Emily um, did not feel a great sisterhood with these new sisters-in-law. Um, they were, from, in many ways, out of step with the women's rights movement. Um, the women's rights movement had declared its first goal to be suffrage, the vote. Um, Elizabeth Blackwell was especially uh, vocal in disagreeing with this as the first priority. She believed that as long as women were in thrall to their husbands, brothers, and fathers, giving them the vote was like giving more votes to the men because they would just tell their women how to use it. She believed that she needed, that women needed to declare and, and, and prove their own independence before the vote would be anything useful to them. Um, so they disagreed with these sisters-in-law. They also disagreed with each other, Elizabeth and Emily, about the role of a woman doctor. Um, Elizabeth, because of her um, lost eye and because of her own inclinations, just leaned more toward public policy, moral reform, public health, and away from practice. So she really believed that the role of a woman doctor was to be a teacher armed with science. And she did a lot more lecturing and speaking than practice. Emily thought the role of a woman doctor was to be as good a practitioner and surgeon and medical professor as any man. And that's what she set out to be. So just after founding the Women's Medical College in 1869, the two sisters parted ways and spent the last 40 years of their lives on different continents. Elizabeth went back to England where she had always yearned to settle um, and pursued public health and policy and moral reform. Emily remained in New York and led the institutions they had founded with great skill until the end of her career. Ironically, I think, so sustaining her sister's legacy in the US almost at the expense of her own because today, if you've heard the Blackwell name, you think of Elizabeth and not Emily. Um, so that's the outline of the Blackwell story. And this moment, um, as we do nothing but think about public health and as we celebrate the inauguration of our first female vice president, um, it feels like a particularly good moment for the Blackwell story. I like to finish with um, with this picture uh, and, and, a, and a story that goes with it. If you uh, go online and Google Elizabeth Blackwell and go to images, this picture comes up every time. It's everywhere. It, it, it's attached to articles about her, uh, documentary films, websites. It's at least it's on the cover of at least one biography. Um, it's a lovely portrait of a of a of a woman who looks like she is about to conquer the future. Um, this picture is not a picture of Elizabeth Blackwell. How do I know that? Well, it's it's cataloged at the, at the Museum of the City of New York. And if you flip it over, you can see that it was taken at Dana's Photo Portrait Gallery on 14th Street and 6th Avenue. Uh, Dana did not have a photo portrait gallery on 14th Street and 6th Avenue until the 1880s when Elizabeth Blackwell was in her 60s. This woman is not Elizabeth Blackwell. It's probably one of her nieces. Why does this misattribution persist when the proof is right on the back of the photo? I think it persists because this woman looks the way we want Elizabeth Blackwell to look. 
Um, we like our heroines to be likable, to be adorable in some way. And um, Elizabeth Blackwell and Emily Blackwell were not. They were not interested in being likable. And a lot of the things they did were distinctly unlikable, yet they did things that changed the world. And I think it's a great moment for us all to try a little harder to recognize greatness, even when it is in a package that um, is not perky and pretty like a storybook princess. So I'm gonna stop there. Thank you for listening all this time. And I'm gonna unshare this and maybe we'll do some questions. Thank you so much. That was absolutely compelling. Great slides, great presentation, learned a lot. Thank you. Um, so yes, audience members do please uh, add your questions and comments to the chat at the right side of your screen. Um, and we'll pull them up and address them to our speaker. Um, we have one there already. Oh, excellent. Yes, good. Um, who paid for the education and travel of Elizabeth and Emily? Good question. It seems to be a popular question. I, I get that one a lot. Um, yeah, you, 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 it makes you wonder when, when they were broke in Cincinnati, how did they get where they went? Um, well, the first thing they did was start teaching like crazy. All, all of the, the eldest Blackwells were all uh, women, and they immediately went to work teaching and earning money to keep their family from financial ruin. Um, I think that that created a funny kind of gender inversion in their family where their brothers, as they finally came of age and went to work themselves, had a certain degree of gratitude toward these sisters who had rescued the family. And as they went into business themselves, were unusually willing to support their sisters in their rather unusual goals. Um, so there was brother support. There was some cousin support. There were Blackwells in England still who were a little bit well better off than the Blackwells in Cincinnati. Um, and then once Elizabeth and Emily founded the institution, um, the, the, the infirmary, um, there was donor support. Uh, they managed to attract the attention of a lot of sort of forward thinking, many Quakers who supported this idea of women doing this in medicine and were willing to support it financially. And then once the institution existed, they were also able to get support from New York State, um, which you know gave a certain amount of grant money to institutions like that. So that all together um, paid their way. Great. What surprised you most in the course of your research? What surprised me most? Um, I should have a better, I should have a pat answer to this question. There were so many surprises. I mean, um, I guess what surprised me most was the idea that Elizabeth Blackwell launched herself on this incredibly difficult journey um, just because she decided to. Um, there was no model for her. There was no woman doctor ahead of her. Um, there was a chorus of people around her saying this was going to be too hard. Don't bother. Um, and she didn't really like science and medicine, yet she wanted to make this point and she wanted to make it so strongly that she was willing to devote her life to this pursuit, even though she lost an eye in, in the process. Um, I guess that's a, that's a very large answer. Um, there were smaller answers too. Um, there were a lot of surprises. When you start studying 19th century medicine, there are a lot of surprises about the, the, the things that people found, thought were normal in medical practice. I, I liked it. I was so surprised by so much of that that it made me wonder in 150 years, what are people going to think is appalling about our current medical practice today? <laughs> Yeah, I guess it's refreshing that so much is surprising about 19th century medicine because we don't believe it anymore. It's good to know we don't believe it anymore. Right. right. The progress keeps happening. Yes. Um, did the adopted daughters follow in their mother's footsteps and enter the field of medicine? And if so, did they lead notable careers as well? That's a good question, too. So the adopted daughters were adopted in two very different ways. Um, Elizabeth Blackwell in the mid 1850s when Emily is training in Edinburgh and no patients are showing up and she's a little worried about how this is all going to go, um, she was quite lonely and she, being Elizabeth Blackwell, decided to change that. So she went to Randall's Island where the orphanage was and she picked out an Irish orphan named Kitty Barry who was about six at the time and she brought her home as and she wrote about this very explicitly as sort of an interesting combination of servant and ward and fan. She, she, she wanted this child to grow up to be her companion. 
And that is what Kitty did. Um, I think always feeling grateful to Dr. Elizabeth, she was never invited to call her mother. Um, she kind of became Elizabeth's acolyte throughout life and was never given an opportunity to consider marriage or career. Um, she just stuck with Elizabeth throughout her life. Um, it's a little bit alarming. Um, not not a, a setup that you recognize as necessarily that healthy, but it worked for them. Um, Emily adopted an infant um, in a much more mainstream and recognizable family kind of way. Um, she adopted an infant, named it, named her after her mother, raised her to call her mom, and you know this is a child who signed all her letters to Emily with kisses, and grew up to marry and give her four grandchildren. Um, so that was a much more um, sort of conventional, emotionally recognizable path. Um, but no, neither of their of their daughters went into medicine. Um, Elizabeth and Emily's nieces, their their brother Sam's, two of their brother Sam's daughters did come to study at the at the Women's Medical College and became doctors. Cool. Um, someone points out that the Beecher family also lived in Cincinnati. Were they acquainted? Yes, in, 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 indeed. I think the Beechers, uh, <laughs> the Blackwells were were extremely intellectual and quite elitist in their intellectual snobbery. Uh, I think it was very reassuring to them that the Beechers were in Cincinnati too, um, because the Beechers were extraordinary in every direction. And um, and that sort of gave them hope that there would be a level of, of, of intellectual engagement for them there. Um, and they, yeah, they, be, they, they got to know all the Beechers. Um, Harriet Beecher Stowe was um, not, she, she loved the idea that of, of a woman doctor, but told Elizabeth that she thought it would be just too hard um, and, and was sort of discouraging about it. Henry Ward Beecher um, actually was present at the opening of the infirmary, was one of the people that kind of launched it at the opening ceremony. At the time, he was probably the most famous man in New York and the Blackwells were, were, were savvy about deploying people who were better at PR than they were. So yeah, the Beechers were part of their, their story. Um, someone asks, uh, arriving in Paris just after the revolution of 1848, did Elizabeth comment at all on the event or the aftermath in her letters? Hi, Bianca. Um, an excellent question from my friend, Professor Calabresi. Um, in, in fact, she did comment on it. She got to Paris in 1849 when unrest was still everywhere. Um, and she got there in July when the, the combination of the heat and cholera and political unrest was was a little scary. And she did write about it. She wrote about, um, she wrote she was very interested in politics, and so she wrote about it with some remove, kind of as an observer. And then I think she she was quite relieved to disappear into the convent where La Maternité was, which felt very safe and contained because um, there were soldiers marching around with fixed bayonets in the streets. Um. Were you confident about your subject as you moved along or were there times when you doubted what you were doing? Oh, an excellent question from Bill Bardell. Um, uh, you're never, you're, I, I'm always consumed with doubt. I, 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 I challenge you to find a biographer who's not consumed with doubt at every step of the process. Um, uh, as I said, Elizabeth and Emily Blackwell are, are, are sometimes hard to like. And I think that was part of why there hadn't been a major biography of them recently. Um, people would approach them and think, oh, good, feminist icon, I want to write about her. And then they would discover, wait a second, there's a lot about her that's kind of misogynist. Maybe this is not what I want to write about. Um, that actually appealed to me. I, 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 the, the complexity there is sort of what drew me along. Um, and, uh, and, and the history of medicine is just enthralling to me. So um, even though I had doubts, I never had enough doubts to slow me down. Very good. We're the beneficiaries. Um, you mentioned with the punch cartoon that Emily was not a fan of the new bloomers. Is there any record of what Emily and Elizabeth as doctors thought of the dress reform movement's efforts to make women's clothes healthier and more comfortable? Because we know those corsets were a problem for women's right. health. Right. Well, they were appalled by bloomers. Lucy Stone would wear bloomers and they would sort of go like this um, because they were the they were that early kind of feminist that believed that the way to do it was to be irreproachably excellent and the world would come to meet you to not to do sensational things, not to do things that that were shocking, to do things that were just undeniably excellent and the world would come to meet you. Um, 
Lucy Stone was of that next, slightly next generation, even though they weren't that different in age, of, of more radical activism. Um, at the same time, Elizabeth and Emily A um, were not fashionistas. They were they they worked and they needed to be comfortable. Um, they 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 always took care to present themselves in a way that kept them from being underestimated because they didn't want people to look down on them. Um, but they dressed quite plainly. Um, and there was also a lot in Elizabeth's writings on public health on, on, and on women's health against corsets and things like that. But um, when it came to it, I think her need not to alienate the establishment ended up trumping the the, the health aspects, the, the health deficits of, of corsets. And she always, um, I think, stayed much sort of within mainstream fashion just so as not to make waves. So there's an interesting tension there. Mm -hmm. um. <laughs> So you may be chuckling at this next question, which I love also. Um, did you have a sister you would have preferred over the other to have lunch with? Right. <laughs> you know, it's funny. I think when it comes right down to it, I'm not sure I really would have wanted to have lunch with either of them. But if I had to choose, I would have chosen Emily because I think she was, um, I think she was better at emotional connection. I think she was, um, and, and she was more interested in the science, and so am I. Um, that said, I don't mean to say that I didn't like them. I love these two women. Um, but I think what I love about them is their determination, their incredible strength and brilliance. And none of that has to do with um, congeniality. So I'm not sure that they, I, I mean, I think I, 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 would, I would love to get in a time capsule and observe them, but, but you know, when it comes to the, you know, the the old political test of which candidate, the candidate you vote for is the one you want to have a beer with, that's not how I saw them at all. I I, I saw them in a very different in a different way. Um, but yes, I think I probably would have felt more kindred spiritness with Emily than with Elizabeth. It was hard. I don't think anybody. There weren't. There were very few people that that really felt kindred spiritness with Elizabeth. She did not invite that kind of closeness. Um, so let's see, any record that Emily ran into Lucy, wife of John James Audubon in Henderson, Kentucky. Lucy was also an emigre from England dragged by a visionary impulsive father. Fascinating. I don't know. I would love to know because the Lucy Audubon story is another amazingly interesting story. Um, I'm going to have to look into that. Thank you for pointing it out. Um, so you talked a little bit about the circumstances of each of them adopting a daughter and that the daughters went on to other things but not medicine. Can you talk a little more about their relationships with their daughters? Yeah, I, I mean, Kitty was um, was Dr. Elizabeth's acolyte. She she at her when when after I guess when um, when Elizabeth died, um, one commentator I think it was actually Henry and Lucy Stone's daughter Alice Stone Blackwell. Um, in her eulogy for Elizabeth talked about how Kitty had fit herself to all of Elizabeth's sharp edges like an eiderdown quilt. Um, she really um, put herself second to this woman who she felt was important. And when Elizabeth died, she requested, um, when Kitty died, sorry, when Kitty died many years later at, at a very old age, she requested that her ashes be buried in Elizabeth's grave. So even though um, on the surface, it looks a little strange that this woman who campaigned to have a profession would not allow her adopted daughter to have one. That that strikes you as very dissonant. Um, at the same time, I think there was a real bond between them, um, not necessarily one that's all that categorizable today. Um, I, again, Emily and her daughter, who went by the the nickname Nanny, um, were close and you know nanny was at emily's deathbed and and with her four little boys and that was a much more um, recognizably familial relationship um so i'm gonna throw in one more question uh, before the last one that's on the screen right now which is a great one to sort of wrap up with if anybody else has a question please do throw it in there um so you were talking about the u.s sanitary commission and i got sort of excited because i recalled that last fall i had the opportunity to learn about george templeton strong 
on the occasion of his 200th birthday and uh, some of our library staff put together a little webinar about him. Now he was the non-medical professional uh, sort of chair of the organizational group behind the US Sanitary Commission, at least in New York City, as I understand it. Are there stories about him intersecting with the Blackwells at all? Not really. I mean, that was the thing is that once it got to the level of, so Henry Whitney Bellows, who was uh, one of their one of their supporters, one of their donors, um, one of the people who was present at that original meeting um, in, in the Blackwell's parlor to, to create the, the gathering. Um, he, you know, what happened was it started with the men who were right alongside them, the Blackwell's, you know, started organizing with the men who were right alongside them. And then quickly those men kind of moved off into, you know, joining the architects of the war in, in Washington and the Blackwells were sort of left behind. Um, and that was the root of their discontent with the whole situation. Um, so no, they didn't really end up working or intersecting with, with those designers of the US Sanitary Commission. That was the, that was the problem. Mm -hmm. um, uh, Elizabeth eventually later in the war did go down to Washington and actually met Abraham Lincoln um, just sort of by chance. Um, but I think it, by that point she had, she had moved on in her own mind from, from being someone who could help in that regard. And she was already thinking about the college. So. Very interesting. Um, so I just want to highlight to everybody present that we do, uh, and by we, I mean our friends at the Corner Bookstore, have copies of the Doctors Blackwell available for purchase. And you can get a signed copy or a signed and personalized copy by emailing the bookstore directly. So the first link there is to just purchase a copy and get it sent right to you through their bookshop account. Uh, and then that's their email address. If you want to email them and say, please, here's who I am and please send me a signed or personalized copy of the book uh, our speaker tonight We'll be happy to make one out to you and that will get dispatched to you. So please take advantage of that. So great final-ish question in the chat here. I always like to add what's coming up next and somebody phrases it as, do you have some sisters in mind for your next book? <laughs> um, no, please suggest some. <laughs> um, I, I, I'm in that that in-between place that's very uncomfortable and that and, and which spurs you on to figure out what is coming next. But so far, I have no idea. Maybe it's on stack one. Yes. I'm going to have to get back in there and look. <laughs> Very good. Very good. Uh, Janice, anything you'd like to add that we haven't talked about or that came up in the question here? No, I'm 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 grateful for for this and and it's always my favorite audience. So thank you for being here. Thank you so much. Ah, uh, yes, Carolyn, our teacher uh, <laughs> says your next idea definitely on stack one or stack two or three. So there's right. plenty of opportunities. I'm <laughs> coming. I'm coming. I have a book that's overdue, so I got to get over there anyway. <laughs> Good excuse to go and wander in the stacks. Um, so thank you so much, Janice P. Nimora. Thank you, Carolyn Rogers. Thanks for everybody for joining us. Thank you. Have a great night.